right now we're at uh, land that I grew up at. It's land that has been in my family for a hundred years, more. <laughs> and Wisconsin is this right here. We are about up here. Yeah, it was a great time. And this is probably, this is definitely my family, our homestead. This is where we are. My first musical memory I have is being in a sort of like a kinder music class. It was a group piano class and I was one of maybe eight or nine girls and boys. At the end of the class there was this uh, show and tell part where the teacher asked if someone wanted to come up and play something and I sat down and played Popeye the Sailor Man, the theme from it, and I had kind of figured it out on the piano at home, um, you know, so I just played that. That's, that's my first memory, is like playing that. And I think I probably remembered it because people clapped at the end and I was like, oh, I had like a, a marked moment of this is, this is good, this is cool, I guess. And people like that, I just did that, or whatever. We had an old, uh, um, an old upright, like a studio upright Schimmel piano from Faribault, Minnesota. It's because I stared at the words Schimmel, Faribault, Minnesota for probably like 6,000 hours uh, uh, in my first 18 years because uh, I just practiced and looked at it. Um, my dad would just sit down and, and he would pull some sheet music out sometimes. Sometimes he would just play by ear and he would just... Uh, always at like, this easy loping kind of river calliope, like general, like American kind of hymns that he would make up. And it's funny that that's in there still, that thing my dad plays. When we were growing up, our parents had to tell him to get out of the house constantly and he still didn't do it. You know, he was probably the only eighth grader in America covering The Way It Is by Bruce Hohens reading note for note at the talent show. His brain will occupy any amount of free time with thinking about playing. Oh yeah. That, dude. <laughs> this is like, this is way later in my life. Like I found JB like, I don't know, maybe five or six years ago. And um, you know, which is great because it's just like I spent so much of like my teenage years just only listening to blues pretty much and that was it. Like only listening to, and I never really got into anything new. It was always just, you know, 50s and 60s, 40s, 50s and 60s blues is just kind of I think the heyday of when all that stuff was going down. Um, yeah, just played just at home, just played by myself, was just always practicing whatever was... Whatever was on, whatever I could just figure out and just kind of follow things around and eventually just met uh, a crew that ended up being my best friends to this day um, at this camp and we formed a band. Kind of ended up building this bond and this friendship that really was the more important thing than anything else. And we all started to realize like, whoa, you know, this is special what's happening here. So this is a picture of um, Bill Frizzell. We went and saw um, Bill Frizzell was one of my favorite musicians of all time. And, uh, and my brother Brad was there, and my friend Justin, and my friend Trevor, and we all went and saw him what together. What is that? Brad. Brad, right there. Is, uh, is that you? No, that's me. With huh? short hair. And that's Bill Frizzell. And who's that? Justin. That's Fern. That's what Trevor. We went and saw him at the Sierra Cultural Center, and I have a Bill Frizzell tattoo right here. All of us have the, all of us got the same tattoo called it's called That Was Then, which is a, uh, off of his record, Good okay. Dog, Happy Man. It's a ninth song. Later in the game, we're talking like 2004, 2005, almost 10 years later. Um, you know, some of the members had gone off and just you know, went, went to college and grad school and did some other things. But there were a few of us, this core of us, that were just the music, we kept following the music and that's what we kept following. And at some point when you're living in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, population 80,000, you're just going to kind of have a uh, glass ceiling. <laughs> you know, you're just going to hit some point where you're just, I don't know, 
it was our age and it was the time and it was the place. We just all were like, you know what? At some point, we just got to put our money where our mouth is and just move someplace that we, we could start over and start from the ground up. And we knew we had to do that. So we just like picked a place and we were like really picked a place based on the fact that there were like a couple of record labels in the area, which were like Merge and Yep Rock and moved to North Carolina in yeah. 2005. In the process of just like touring the world, it just like had a chance to just sit and think a lot and you have a chance to wait a lot around venues and whatever. And I just, I just found myself feeling like there was something else that I had to say and I didn't know what it was, but something was tugging at me It's for a while. And at some point, I just like remember writing a couple of things that I knew weren't for anything yet. I, it wasn't for what I was doing. It wasn't for any projects that I was in. It was just something that had like way deeper roots inside me that felt like, you know, I don't know where they were coming from. Right around that time, I got this call from my buddy to come work on the Blind Boys of Alabama record in um, 2013. That experience was absolutely incredible. And in many ways, it was like a baptism, I guess I would say for me to just give me permission to just follow what sounds were in my head. Because a lot of the sounds that I had in my head from where I grew up up here I didn't feel like I had access or permission to because I'm so far removed from where that is. I'm far removed culturally, I'm far removed spatially, and far removed just in time from where those guys are coming from. My takeaway from it was just the permission to just go. And then right after I finished that, so much stuff started coming to me. So many things and ideas started coming to me. Instead of saying no, I said yes to them. And that was, it just felt like it snowballed I'm not after going that. In my way. Where are you going? What? Go with me. We're all going inside. I'll see you in a little bit. I want to go watch a movie. I know you do. And lucky for you, I have a rehearsal tonight for you. I realized I had to find some space. I live in a small house and I have a child and dogs that bark at small instances. Uh, so it's not exactly a recording environment. So a buddy of mine has a, a cabin up in Galax, Virginia. So I just went up there for four or five days and just sat just by myself. Most amount of time I've ever been by myself, ever, my whole life. And um, just morning to night, just all I did was just whatever was coming out of me was just happening. It just happened and happened. And uh, like the fourth day, I just it was the first time I actually just listened to it all. Phil thought a lot about what he was going to sing about before he made that record. It took him a long time to articulate those emotions. I remember getting a phone call from him. I was in the parking lot of Dollar General, I think. He was so excited. It was like that was the last piece of the, of the puzzle for him, is to actually have these songs um, that would would speak in a real way about about his own life as a musician. I don't know. It was it was a powerful moment to realize that I had something there and something I was really proud of and that I felt like was saying what I wanted really what I wanted to say and I was really excited about it. It was just really great. And so the first person, 
you know, that I showed it to was my manager, Martin, and uh, my brother, Brad. I'd heard parts of all these songs for a long time. That was just a really big step for him in general that weekend of really just spending a lot of time finding, kind of finding his own voice in it all, which was cool, man. I mean, he played it for me, went for a drive, and it blew my mind. It was awesome. I learned from my friend, Mike Taylor, that you surround yourself by people, musicians that inspire you and that have great skill in wherever you can and however you can and you will make great music. And, you know, enough time has passed that I've had a, enough situations to just be in rooms, be in picking circles, and be in different situations with just North Carolina musicians. I mean, the support is always there. It feels so good at bringing people from different projects together for one thing, but I think it's still like out of all of this intense creative energy from so many different brains comes all sorts of different little ideas. There's a sense of community to, to, his, to his play. I mean, he's very inviting on stage. I mean, you know, like when you're with him on stage, he has a way of, of bringing people together. He's incredible, personally, you know, he's same same way personally. Very warm, very positive, very magnetic, and that and that stuff transfers to playing music together. I mean, when you're with somebody on stage, and they are they are interested in interacting with you, um, inviting you to be a part of their of what they're doing, what they're playing, and, and vice versa. You know, so it was just people that I just had these like really strong connections to, and a certain feeling. I had to reach a certain point where I just was like. Oh yeah, it's gotta be them. So I just got all these musicians that I loved, that I figured out were, um, figured an open spot in their year and, and we just got together and everyone had a really great spirit, you know, moving through it, so. We were driving somewhere, we were on tour and someone sent, sent the record to us and that was the only record that we listened to for the whole time which is pretty embarrassing when you're on a record and all you want to do is listen to the record but it's so huge I mean when I when I heard Southland Mission for the first time it was like whoa okay this is this is incredible this is like a, a record that that we would have all found in our in our parents' record collections. That's not to say that it's like musty because it's very, it's very progressive in its way. The sounds and the way that he approaches the music and the way that he uses the rhythm section is, is really fresh sounding, um, but it feels classic. You know, he's he's like he's like moving in all directions at once. You know, the, like the new stuff that I'm hearing has got bits of soul in it. Um, and and, and R and B and other things that kind of that the, the first that that first solo record you know it, it covered a lot of ground, but it kind of you know it didn't cover as much ground as he seems to be covering now. He seems to be growing in like all directions at once, which is pretty fascinating. You know, I'm I'm a one trick pony. I'm a linear person. You know, I'm I'm going in slowly in this direction. You know, and Phil's kind of going all over the place, which is amazing to watch. The whole time we were making the record, we'd come back and listen to something, and I would just always say the same thing. I'd be like, this sounds huge. And it would be almost like, in a, oh god, this sounds really huge. And I wasn't prepared for like how big the record was sounding. But that record to me is funny because there's no flashy studio wizardry. A lot of the tracks are live tracks that we just sort of built around, but also that like, I think it speaks to the musicianship on the record. It's not a record that should be summed up in a couple sentences, you know? Um, it's a record that people need to spend time with, and um, I feel like people hear a record like Southland Mission and they, it will be a companion of theirs for life. I think the main thing is that it's just, it's really like kind of telling the story of just my, the, my, my 20 year journey of just with music since I like was 14 and like woke up and started until being now 
that's the story of what's happening, of what how, my my path, how I just skipped from rock to rock, and then I just looked back down and was like, well, this is what I got. This is what I see. This is how I see it. You know, that's my journey, and I hope I was honest with it about it enough that I hope think people are just gonna relate to like the openness of it. Are you gonna sing with me? Can we do one real quick? Can I just, uh, let's just sing it together, okay? We'll do 1922. Can we start with the first one? I want you to do that. Yeah, I will, but when I stop, can you just help me um, help me a little bit? Cool. I don't want to help you, he says. You just eat your yogurt then. You just eat that yogurt. Yeah, well, I will some couldn't save a sand. I gave all of my money to the government. I don't know quite how I got spent, but the banks are coming for my deed. Man at the mill can't see, boy, let me get my feed for free, boy. And ain't that the way it is? <laughs> he, uh, he's one of a kind, you know. I think that. To me, that's that's like the most exciting thing about anybody, anybody who's truly one of a kind. People need to know about, and uh, Bill is certainly one of a kind, and it is very exciting to to be able to point people to that, or for him to be able to show people that. Listen, man, I'm 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 Phil Cook, and take a listen. There's nobody like me, and. Uh, that's, that's the truth, you know, and, and that'll be exciting to see that happen. A huge part of this has just felt like um, sort of a pilgrimage that I, I was sort of had to do. And a lot of it is just looking back on the last few years of that pilgrimage and just and listening to what, what came out of it and then just kind of waking up to what, it all, what all was happening. Yeah, I don't, I can't think in the moment, it's just in the aftermath, I just am realizing like how, you know, how much was put into it, you know, how much it gave to it. So, yeah, it felt like a necessary thing. When I worked all summer, couldn't save a sin, I gave all of my money to the government. I don't know quite how it got spent, but the banks are coming for my deed. Man at the mill can't see. You know, you know, like, Phil would be just as excited, like, if I started a band that was, like, only costume based and that involved, like, a lot of fake blood, as he would be, like, if I, you know, decided that I wanted to start doing opera. I think it's just because it, the music asks you to. It's that weird. It's that. It's really a perfect spot. And, and, you know, I look over and Phil is just like beaming, you know, he's just like beaming. And, and I was, you know, we were playing and it was, it was pretty good. And then all of a sudden it just, it got, it got, it got bigger. And I look over again and Phil is not there anymore. He's here with his banjo, just going to town. I'm like, whoa, who does that? Think above anything else. It's, it's, it's music that's full of hope. That's what that energy is. I don't know, like meeting Phil has just reminded, has, has been a reminder that there are people out there in the world that are just kind of, I don't know, they just have a gift. They just have a gift that, that that most people don't have. Leave her down at the bar now. Right, the Alex, please, close, okay, close the door and poop, and then come back outside. Okay. Go ahead. I'll I'll be in I'll be in there in just a little bit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>